uh, afternoon, rather. Uh, I described the limiting uh, equations that uh, you can formally derive and you have to try to derive rigorously. Uh, in the first order case, there were equations on the density uh, row, so there were continuity equations. And in the second order case, as I described just uh, on the last uh, slide that's displayed now, you get a kinetic equation. And of course, uh, what I should say here is that there is a relation between rho and f, which is that uh, you can recover rho by just integrating f with respect to the velocity variable. So uh, the actual density is the marginal, if you want, uh, of f. So uh, it, it, you see rho uh, comes up here. Uh, and so now I want to discuss uh, the, the methods for proving convergence. And the classical methods are uh, fairly old. They go back to the 70s, maybe. Uh, so classical methods. Uh, 70s, or even sometimes earlier. Uh, of course, they, they work for the case of uh, regular interactions. So typically, uh, typically K would be required to be Lipschitz. So of course it doesn't allow for uh, these realistic physical kernels, for instance. Uh, and you can find them in the book by Snitman, who worked a lot of this on, on this, but is also resourced by uh, uh, Brown, Hepp, uh, Dobrushin that are considered classical. Neunzert and Vick. And uh, uh, they, they consist in uh, looking at trajectories. So you can call them trajectorial methods. Thinking a little bit like characteristic characteristics. Uh, so you follow the trajectories of your particles. So you compare X, I to uh, y i t, which is the, so this is the true trajectory, of course, and y i t is the a sort of fictitious, fictitious trajectory. So it's the trajectory of a fictitious particle that would be following the characteristics of of the associated PDE. So you remember we're talking about the PDE now, GT rho plus divergence, K rho rho equals blah, blah, blah. So what you show is that uh, if, if these points are assumed to be initially the same, then they remain close. So that with x i of zero equals y i of zero, we keep x i of t minus y i of t small. And it works by a sort of ground value argument, uh, which of course exploits this Lipschitz character of the, uh, of the force or the interaction kernel K. And now if K is not regular, then people have tried to work around it. And I will come back to this. Uh, so try to work around it by, for instance, uh, controlling minimal distance between the points. So you see that the events that bother you are the, the, the events where some of the points get very close to each other because that's where uh, you hit the singularity of K. And so maybe if you can show that this doesn't happen too often, 
well, that doesn't happen for too many points and also uh, that the points don't get too close, then maybe it's actually okay. Okay, so try to control minimum distance between points. So this has been done uh, uh, more precisely, um, to really, really made into a proof by uh, Ore and Javan. There might be others, but these are the ones I know best. And uh, all of that, all of these ideas, you can sort of uh, package them now in a more modern fashion, maybe, by thinking in terms of metrics. So I would say that a general idea is to find a good metric uh, for which uh, that controls basically the distance between the empirical measure and its limit and its expected limit. And T and rho T, the, the expected limit uh, via a grand value relation. Because I think that at this point we've understood that we cannot hope to pass to the limit directly in the equation because it's nonlinear. Right? The, the, the equation contains, even formally contains products like this. So you can't just you know take a weak limit in the equation. You have to look for a better structure. So what people have been doing is to find good metrics, right? And typically, uh, a good metric that that's often used is the Wasserstein of time metric, so the one Wasserstein of time distance, which you know is defined by W1 mu nu equals soup of integral of F T mu minus mu for F loop sheets. Right, so this metrizes uh, this convergence. Uh, and so here you try to show that uh, W1 mu of t mu of t is uh, exponentially, at most exponentially growing. It will involve typically the Lipschitz norm of k. So exponentially in time growing in terms of the initial uh, distance. So this is a quantitative stability result. Stability, uh, where, what do, you, what do you take from u and u here? Where well, you want to take uh, u of t, for instance, u of t to be the empirical measure. And mu of t to be the limit, to the expected limit, the, the, the one that's your guess. So these are these are probability measures. So you can try to con control the rise of time distance. Uh, and, and of course, the initial data, you will assume that this is small. So if you can prove such a relation, which of course, uh, you have to prove a sort of bond val uh, relation that the time derivative of W1, this thing is controlled by itself. And then it will prove convergence, right? Because it will show that for every fixed T, uh, this thing is also small, at most of the order of this. So all of these uh, classical proofs, you can sort of recast them uh, like this. Uh, and we will uh, use uh, similar ideas. And, and a remark is that for this to be true, I mean, if you hope that something like this is true, you would, you better hope that also, that already uh, you need the limiting equation to satisfy the same uh, well posed mass. Your limiting equation had better be well posed in this, uh, in this space, or stable, let's say. To the 
this metric in the sense that if you have two solutions, right, so it's row one and row two, or two solutions to that limiting equation, you want to expect that W1 of row one, row two is controlled uh, in terms of the initial distance. Yeah. Oh, so if this doesn't hold, you have uh, not much chance of proving this. And uh, another remark is that um, sometimes you can prove these relations provided row one and row two are smooth enough, are regular enough. So that's called uh, strong stability. But if you want to hope to prove something like that, you'd better be able to uh, input here the empirical measure. So the empirical measure is not regular, it's, it's, it's a sum of Dirac's. So you'd be, you'd be able, uh, you have to be able to have one of the two solutions not be too regular. And so even better, uh, we need what is called a weak strong stability property or with strong uniqueness, that is this relation uh, for let's say row two, maybe regular, but row one has to be any probability, which is soon. Okay, so weak strong uniqueness uh, principles in the form of a stability uh, principle like this gives you a good hope of, of proving a convergence uh, with this type of method. So now there's an alternate, uh, another, another set of uh, ideas, which is uh, relative entropy. And the relative entropy method, this is for, uh, this is for situation with diffusion. This is why it works best. That is beta finite. Uh, so you define relative entropy of your density Fn, your law on uh, point configurations relative to, let's say, what you, what you think is uh, the limit. So we, we've said that we were inter interested in proving convergence to these tensorized states. So rho, rapid n times, right? So this is defined as integral of Fn log Fn divided by rho times n times. Of course, you know that in the definition of relative entropy, you could put any probability that you want here. I'm just putting this one if you prefer the, the general uh, law. And you integrate this with respect to Xn. And the normalization that works uh, well here is to divide by n. Okay, and this is uh, just an avatar of the usual relative entropy. And as you may know, this has a sign. So it's not quite a distance, but it's almost a distance. It behaves like a distance and it uh, allows to prove convergence because uh, you have uh, relations that directly relate uh, smallness of the relative entropy to convergence. So for instance, you have this uh, S, uh, sorry, CKP inequality Uh, that says that if you want to look at the total variation between two measures, you can control it by the square root of the relative entropy. Okay, so if, uh, if we can show 
that Hn is small, or even bounded. You get convergence. And so what you try to what you try to show, of course, is that you have a ground value relation of this one. Yeah. Uh, there is even something that's called subadditivity of entropy, I think. And which will uh, allow you to relate the relative entropy of the k point marginals to that of the full thing. So if you can control this relative entropy, uh, you have. Uh, Take a factor k over n in front, which allows you to show that, uh, uh, in fact, if this hn, fn, rho n is bounded, then the k point marginals convert. So when k is fixed, of course. And it's actually interesting that you see that you can take even k not fixed, like you could take k that grows up uh, as long as it's much smaller than, than n, uh, you will still keep, uh, you will still keep convergence. Yeah, I hope I didn't mess up. I'll come back to this. Uh, uh, to this notion a little bit later. Okay, so this method of relative entropy uh, was in particular developed by Japan and Wang in this context. Uh, so what they proved is this. Proved, uh, uh, by Japan and Wang, and that allowed them to treat even the case so beta finite, uh, including the case of some singular interactions. So I will come back to that and describe the structure method. Uh, and let me, let's let's be a little bit more more specific here. So what I what the class of interactions is that k is in w minus one infinity. So basically it suffices that k is the divergence of something bounded. If is bounded, so that's sort of the same. And this k also has to be not too bad. So since Jensu is, I think in the audience, you can correct me if I'm making mistakes the assumptions uh, but uh, so this is uh, this is uh, I think the assumption so it includes bio savoir kernel in 2d uh, by some for some sort of strange reason it includes it but not cool in general or not cool dimension bigger than Of course, the, this relative entropy method was also well known for, for smooth case. Uh, for the smooth case, it was, it was a, a natural uh, object, but uh, I would say the, the advance here was to make it work with singular interaction. And uh, I want to discuss a little bit also what was known on the other approaches. So I mentioned the classical results of Smithman and company. And then there's some more uh, more, recent, more particular results which are uh, 2D uh, point vortex system. 
So I, I, I mentioned this this morning. Uh, so it was uh, when G is minus log, and you have the conservative uh, conservative case. So K equals what curve of G, the Bio Savarlo, eta equals infinity. So that's in 2D. So because this is a particular model in fluid mechanics, this is a model of how vertices in fluids interact. It's a Hamiltonian system, it conserves energy. And this was studied in some famous paper by Goodman, Howe, and Lauren Group in the 90s. Group and Shoshe. Uh, 96. Um, it is the, the proof is specific to the 2D situation because in 2D the log is singular but not too singular, it's almost regular, and somehow they can pass to the limit directly in the equation thanks to that. So there were also some work of Ore. And then the, the situation with noise, which I told you leads to Navier Stokes. Uh, in vorticity form. So people call this the point, uh, sorry, the, the point vortex system, but also the point approximation of area. Uh, it, it's, it's a way of uh, of making a discrete approximation of the continuum PD. But of course, we can do it uh, as, a, as a problem of convergence of its own. So the one with noise, there's results of Osada and Fournier, Ore, and Schler. More recent. And there is Pat Light Keller Segal. Uh, 1996. Which is the same, uh, the same thing in 2D, but uh, this time it's uh, it's not conservative, it's it's a gradient flow, but for an attractive interaction. So k equals plus gradient g. Uh, so t is again minus log, so it's attractive. Uh, so there are some results. Fournier, Jourdain, and the most recent results of Press, uh, Jabin, and Wang that I will I will talk in more details about. Okay, so this is specific to this two D log interaction, which is barely singular, you know, it's, like it's just a little bit of singularity, not too much. Now, when we talk about inverse powers, that's, uh, so when G is singular, one over X to the S. Uh, so here we, we're going to have to distinguish between uh, sub-coulombic and super-coulombic. Right? So if you remember, D minus two is the Coulomb case. So S less than D minus two is what I could call sub-coulombic. Uh, so here, the ideas of the smooth case can somehow carry through, as I mentioned, by uh, trying to control the minimal distances between points, like showing that these bad events of having points that are too close to each other uh, are somehow under control. Uh, but that always breaks at d minus two. So we can, we can play with that all the way to d minus two, but at d minus two, uh, it never works. So you cannot treat Coulomb like this, but you can go all the way to T minus two. Okay, and then uh, in dimension one, okay, so this is sub Coulomb uh, T equals one and S strictly less than one. 
When you're in dimension one, something particular happens that helps a lot is that these uh, inverse power interactions become convex. It's convex. And that's only in dimension one. So if you look at, the, at this in dimension two, you can see it's not a convex function. And you can really exploit uh, the convexity of the interaction to make some uh, sort of special types of proof work. Uh, so there is this result by Berman, Oman, and Carillo, Ferreira, and Precioso. And they, they all uh, take advantage of this complexity of uh, the interaction, and they make a sort of Wasserstein gradient flow approach. I think it's in Wasserstein infinity. You know how you have Wasserstein P, so you can define Wasserstein infinity. So if I if I remember correctly, but in any case, it's a sort of gradient flow approach that takes advantage of the complexity. Okay, so then um, there is this uh, this approach that um, I sort of advocated, uh, which is uh, this modulated energy approach. So in this context of these uh, discrete problems, it was first uh, in this paper of Mitya Durant's the case D less than two and S to two than less than one it was made by Mitya Durang in his thesis. Uh, and it was in fact uh, originating in a, a paper of mine uh, on, on the convergence of vortices in these Polandro equations. So, um, in field convergence, for vortex equations, actually parabolic in Bolando and goes to type ski are the names of the equations. So this was purely 2D problems, but in these problems, the the original problem is not discrete. So you're not trying to go from discrete to continuum. You're trying to go from a, a PDE that has a parameter to uh, another PDE with no parameter. Actually, the limiting PDE is Euler or um, some dissipative version of Euler. Okay, so the modulated energy uh, method there is a little bit more complex, but once you apply it to the discrete case, it becomes this. It becomes actually simpler, but uh, for some, uh, there are some difficulties in making uh, a complete proof that restricted the regime to these low dimensions and low, uh, low powers. Okay, so then later I had the, the whole range a paper of myself in, um, I don't know, it first came out in 2018, but it was published later, which you have in the references uh, that I sent to you for the poster. Uh, so it, it actually works for all, uh, all Coulomb cases, so NED. Two, and also um, all S that's between D minus two and D. Now we can put less or equal. So all super cool on big cases. Okay, so these are real cases that are super cool on big. So I will be describing this, of course. Uh, and then there's a paper by Han and Guillen. That was in vague and test. So just a bit more recent from last year. 
where we uh, also use a modulated, we, we sort of adapt the idea of modulated energy method, but to work now in the sub Coulomb case as well. So all S less than D. So sub L super Coulomb. And also a little bit relaxed. So you can relax a little bit the class of G so that they are of risk type, but not exactly risk. So I will talk a little bit about this, but it means you want G to have the same type of singularity as the inverse power, but you, you, you can perturb it a little bit. There's a little bit of wiggle room uh, that allows you to treat uh, more general interaction, not be as rigid as saying, okay, I have to do it exactly on the first part. And also by, uh, in order to extend to, to this, we, we sort of revisited the, the proof and the point of view on it and uh, understood it in a, in a slightly different way. So this provides an alternate, if you want, an alternate proof for the cases that were uh, previously done by these, uh, uh, by these types of, of relations that we're working, I told you up to S equals G minus two. So strictly less than G minus two, the sub, sub on the cases, you can do them like that. But you can also do that by the modulated energy uh, method. I should mention one thing, which is I always, uh, you always see this restriction up here, here, S less than T. So why is it? So it's not just a, a well, it's actually a restriction on what we know how to do, what we can treat, but the restriction is not uh, random. It's because when S is bigger than D, it's a completely different regime. So S bigger than D is called a hyper singular regime of interactions. And you see, of course, if S is much bigger, the singularity is much stronger, but also the decay of the interaction is much faster. So somehow it's a it's much shorter range. And in particular, what happens is that these uh, limiting interactions that you would want to define g x minus y zero of x zero of y, this thing is never going to be convergent. As a, as a double integral, even if rho is very smooth. So even if you take a very smooth rho, say uh, even a uniform density or anything like that, uh, the singularity of G near the diagonal is not integrable. So it's an integral of one over X minus Y to the D, that's, that's not integrable. And of course, if S is bigger than D, uh, it's even less integrable. Okay, so these potentials, you know, when you when you make these convolutions k convolve with rho, it implies that you have to give a meaning to things like this: g x minus y, the rho of y, and when g is too singular, these things start to be uh, problematic. So, in fact, this mean field equations, the mean field equations that I've uh, announced as a uh, a target, you know, that's probably not the right equation. Uh, the right equation should be something else, and somehow these methods uh, are not able to capture to capture the right. Thing. So this is why uh, we, we will see this restriction as less than D. It's because uh, basically all these potential theory-based uh, arguments, when you create these potentials that are G controlled with rho or K controlled with rho, uh, start to break down for such singularity. 
Okay, so this is uh, this is for the sort of review of what's around, and I, I will finish this review with the second order case. The second order case, uh, you remember, you have uh, Newton's law type of uh, and you have a kinetic formulation. So the picture is a little bit similar. So when s is strictly less than d minus two, it's okay. And this was this was a uh, but not easy. But it was done by Ore and Jabin. It's convergence to Vlasov uh, degrees, not Vlasov Poisson. But... And then when s is d minus two, that's called Vlasov Poisson. That's open. But there were some sort of partial results. Uh, where people were cutting off the interaction. So the singularity of G, you cut it off, but of course you have to cut off at the length scale. And the length scale will depend on N. So uh, that's kind of cheating if you want a little bit. So works of Lazaro, Pichu, and people. And so with this cutoff, they're able to prove uh, convergence. I think there's a couple of other uh, papers. Also Lazarovici Law and Boyer speaker. But all with the same idea. And there are some results with this, uh, because people are interested in these flocking models or swarming models. So when K is quite regular, of course things are okay. And some rougher kernels are done. But uh, as I said, not the Coulomb case. So there's also a paper by, I think in the paper of Zabin one that also can, also can treat the second order case. With nice enough kernels by the Jabin one method. And so for the Coulomb case, the only thing that we have is uh, the monokinetic situation. This is done by Durax and myself. So what does it mean the monokinetic uh, case? It means that you assume that at the initial time, your distributions in particle velocities is a distribution in particles tensored with a unique velocity at each point of space. So you see, it means if you look, you have a density of uh, the distribution of particles, but for each given position, you have a unique possible velocity. You have a Dirac in velocity. You don't have a whole velocity profile like a max gradient or something like that. But you have this unique, uh, so that's what's called monokinetic case. So if you assume your initial data is like that, uh, there exists a monokinetic on that, if you want, to Vlasov Poisson. Uh, so you, you, you remain monokinetic. It remains monokinetic, and uh, then it becomes a system in row U. 
right? So U is this velocity, yeah? Depends on position and go. Uh, and then this thing is called pressure layer, scalar pressure. Pressure less. So this is what is treated again by the same modulated energy method uh, that I introduced for the, you know, that is, works for the first order. So I will start by uh, now describing to you a little bit the modulated energy method. What is it about? So it's again an idea of using a uh, weak strong in weakness principle. So but for a good metric, for a metric which is based on G itself. So now I'm, I'm talking always of kernels that derive from a direction G. Based on G. So think of G, Coulomb, or Lewis. Uh, right, so you remember what I call Lewis is this inverse power. So you want to use this Coulomb based or Lewis based metric. So it's the thing where, uh, you know, if you have two probability densities, mu and nu, the distance squared between uh, mu and nu is this double integral, so Rg plus Rg of g of x minus y, t minus mu of x, t mu minus mu of y. Okay, so you see here mu minus nu, you integrate it, you make the convolution with G and you reintegrate it with respect to itself. So if G is really uh, one over X to the S, you can actually recognize that this thing is a negative Sobolev norm, right? So in Fourier, this is integral of g hat u minus mu hat squared. And g hat, well, the uh, Fourier transform of one of the x to the s, if I'm not mistaken, is going to be like one of the c to the d minus s. So here, you recognize the negative Sobolev norm, so it's going to be h dot t minus s over t. Okay. It's just a Sobolev now. Okay, so immediately you see it's a metric. It's, it's a good metric. But it's actually as good to keep it in this form, to think of it in this form. And we will see it does mix right with this conversion. The only problem with this metric is it doesn't accept Dirac masses. It doesn't accept Dirac. Uh, so if you check, it 
delta naught does not belong to the space HD minus S over two, at least not for these uh, S's that we're interested in. Okay, so that's the first problem, but let's ignore this for now. Uh, so what you want to prove first, let's say a plausibility test for this metric, plausibility test is to show a weak strong uniqueness for the limiting equation. Okay, so that is U1, rho one rho two, two, or two solutions to my limiting equation. So now I'm gonna, I'm gonna just do the one with no temperature, this one. With let's say one of the two being smooth. So I'm gonna say rho two, is as regular as I want. We'll see how much a regular we need. Uh, then we want to show that row one minus row two is bounded by some exponential, a constant that depends maybe on the norms of row two, you know, some, some norms of row two. So I will tell you exactly what you need. You need two derivatives of G control with row two to be bounded. And T, uh, and of course, then you multiply by the initial. Uh, Zero minus row two. So this is my Coulomb metric here. Or my use metric. Okay, so I, I want to be able to show this. And if I can show this for any row one probability measure, maybe empirical measure, although we know that we cannot put the rights, then we have some hope. Okay. So before uh, going on to show this to you, uh, I, I want to comment on how uh, why this thing is called a modulator than a why modulator than a uh, because we are going to compute time derivative of a certain distance. That's going to be my distance between u and t and rho t. That's a certain, uh, this thing is like an energy, so this distance, Coulomb degrees distance can also be seen as an energy. And actually, when you go back to the formula here, you can see maybe you can. Think of it as a as a potential uh, total potential energy, but it's modulated because it's it's relative to something that's moving in time. So you modulate it. It's an energy of the configuration xn. The configuration is here via its uh, xn here. Yeah. Uh, it's modulated by the limiting solution. That's moving so this is a terminology that's chosen by analogy to modulate it by limiting solution. Uh, 
by analogy with modulated entropy methods relative entropy methods that have been used for many years actually to prove convergence of a particle system to hydrodynamics limits, uh, also kinetic to fluid equations. Uh, so here it is Yao, Faradan, uh, with relative entropy methods, uh, kinetic to fluid. Bonnier, Saint Raymond, etc. Okay, so these are these are the names. So what are we going to do about these singularities that don't fit in the modulated energy? You see here, you cannot put the Dirac because well, if you put the Dirac, G at zero is infinity. So with singularities, uh, we define. So now that's the true definition that we're going to use. So we just renormalize if you want by removing the singularity. So for any xn, so that's any configuration of points, and any mu probability density, we can define f of x and mu to be double integral of g of x minus y. So now I'm going to put the empirical measure. So I do everything the same. Empirical measure minus u. Empirical measure minus u of y. Yeah, so there is a D here. So what's the difference here is this. So this is the diagonal of RD cross RD that you remove. This is the complement of the diagonal. Okay, so when you integrate on the complement of the diagonal, uh, you remove the self-interactions of the points. You see, you have XI and XI. You can't really see those terms. Where xi would be xi, it would be some infinity of the power remove. So now we can accept Dirac, and this is our true modulated energy. And so you can, mod you can modulate with respect to the limiting solution u that depends on t. Uh, you can do all sorts of things. But the problem that appears is that now. It's no longer clear that this is a metric. You pay a price, which is that this is no longer the Sobolev norm that I was talking about, which mimics the previous thing. Of course, it will agree. It will agree with it for whenever you have uh, densities that are regular, you know, uh, absolutely continuous. But this one is no longer a positive one. Right? So no longer have F non negative. Um, so things like that. But however, the bottom line is that it's still okay. But it will be okay because we can prove things that are substitute for that. And I will show you. For instance, you will prove that okay, it's not positive, but it's bounded below by uh, minus c over n. 
and it will still be a good uh, way of metroizing uh, with convergence. Okay, so the proof will consist in showing, of course, the ground value relation. Showing something like this. Ptf less than cf, so what I mean is ptf from t relative to rho t less than cf from t relative to rho t. Okay. And it will involve working with the potential, the coulomb or risk potential. which you can denote H. So for any measure, so let's say mu, so you have mu a distribution or difference of two like measures, you want to make this potential. G can tell you mu. Um, so for instance, when we were talking about these quantities, you remember I, I mentioned, well, you can see this as a, as an energy. So I said we have d mu, d mu minus mu of x, d mu minus mu of y. So let's think of here, think of mu equal a, dis a, a difference between an empirical measure and wall front. So if you have a quantity like this, then you can rewrite it in terms of these convolutions. This is just integral of h mu t mu. Right, so so far, nothing special. But now, for the first time, we're going to use the Coulomb uh, nature of the interaction. And, and now I'm going to start specializing to Coulomb for a little bit. Uh, and I will talk about this later. And now let's specialize the Coulomb. Interaction case. So G really is the Coulomb kernel. So what you know about G is then that minus Laplace and G is the yeah you know, G is the fundamental solution. So minus Laplace and G is a Dirac. Well, so it's not quite a Dirac to be honest. It, it is a constant in front because you know, you, you know when I define G equals one of X G minus two, that's not quite the fundamental solution. It's a multiple of the fundamental solution. So you pick up some constant that depends on dimension, so surface of the unit sphere or something. Uh, so, so it's related to something like that. And so you can put this constant in front, it doesn't matter very much. And now, because of this, minus Laplace and H mu, it's minus Laplace and G control with mu, so that's mu. So I, uh, that's C G then. Okay, so you have, uh, that H mu, that's called the Coulomb potential. I already said it. Solves an elliptic equation. Right? Solves the Poisson equation, which is elliptic, and which relates the potential to the distribution of uh, of mu of charges. So, so I think of this as a distribution of charges. And so now I will finish with this. Now I can rewrite integral of h mu d mu. Or I can rewrite this as integral of h mu. And mu is actually minus Laplacian of h mu divided by this constant c v. And if I want, I can integrate by parts. Well, I can integrate by parts provided H mu decays at infinity. So if you see here, I want to integrate by parts with Green's formula because I have H, Laplace, and H. So if I use Green's formula, I'm going to get to the H mu square. CG. So this is provided integral of mu equals zero. So if, if, you have, if you have a situation like this, where you have 
total mass integral to zero. Uh, then H mu, you can check, will decay at infinity. And also its gradient will decay at infinity. So when you do the integration by parts, you don't get boundary terms and it's actually okay. And uh, so in this form, you can uh, trust you can recover that this is a good norm. You can recover the positivity, the coerciveness of, the, of this quantity. So this is the, this book, huh? so this integral of g minus one, one, so this. And you see that this, uh, this thing, which is a sort of total Coulomb interaction of your system, uh, you can rewrite this as a single integral. This is Rd cross Rd, but this is a single integral of the theoretic energy of the potential. So, okay, so we're going to use this uh, reformulation. Uh, next time, when I will show you, it's now to go over. Uh, I will show you next time uh, this uh, weak strong uniqueness principle for the limiting equation in the Coulomb case. The first, I will do it at the level of the limiting equation because that's easier, uh, and then later we will see how to how to do it for the true modulated energy that's defined in this, in this normalized normalizer. Okay. Uh, is there any questions?